All right. Well, thank you all for coming out this week. Uh, why don't I open us in prayer? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for another week uh, together. Please bless this time, enlighten our minds, and strengthen our wills that we may know and love you more, and uh, continue on this path uh, towards this Easter. Amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this week the topic was the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of where we're going to be going, and just looking at different aspects of our knowledge of the Holy Spirit, and maybe some practical stuff on how that can improve our daily life. So um, the catechism starts out with something called the divine pedagogy. And I think we mentioned this previously, um, talking about the incarnation, that one week with all the covenants and everything. But the pedagogy is like how God teaches us. And so the catechism was speaking about how um, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but in each age, a different member of the Trinity is revealed to us. And so in the Old Testament, uh, the Father slowly revealed himself to us. Um, and yet, in a certain way, he was farthest from us. He gave us the law. He kind of put us in our place. He gave us a way to worship. Kind of those fundamental, rudimentary things. Then with Christ, God becomes closer to us and that he becomes one of us. And we see the face of God, so to speak, and he reveals the fullness of truth. But then after Christ leaves us is this third age, where the age of the Spirit, when not only is God one of us, but dwells in each of us who are baptized. So with each stage of this, God gets closer and closer to us. And we have the benefit of living in that third period of time where we have the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who lives in our soul. Um, or, for, or we're baptized or confirmed to live in our soul. Um, so I think that's a good way to think about it. Uh, how do we how do we know this? Well, Pentecost is the big um, feast or moment in Scripture where that Holy Spirit is revealed to us. Does anybody remember before and after Pentecost what the apostles are like? Like, yeah, yeah. Before Pentecost, they were in hiding. Good. And they proclaimed the word. But after Pentecost, they're speaking in the language and the language of the earth. Perfect. Perfect. Before, they're, they lock themselves in the upper room, right? They're scared of being persecuted, um, and they're kind of in hiding. And then afterwards, they're filled with zeal and courage, and they're really not afraid of, of anything anymore. All of them eventually. Um, except for John, give their lives for this. So I think, you know, you see some of these gifts here, courage, zeal, they're speaking other languages, they're healing people. Um, and so that's the working of the Holy Spirit, I think. You can see those fruits that are born in those individuals as they go out. Um, okay, so traditionally there's seven gifts that are the Holy Spirit manifests in the believers. Can anybody name one of them or, or more? Seven gifts of the Spirit. Okay. Okay, fortitude, good. Fear of the Lord, perfect. Okay, one more. Good wisdom. Um, we got three. The other ones are piety, knowledge, understanding, and let's see, what am I missing here? Let's see, piety, fear of the Lord, wisdom, knowledge, understand. Oh, counsel. There we go, counsel. Let me write those out, actually. I've got a marker on this. Okay. So. Thank you. 
right, so these are the things that the Holy Spirit is here to help us with. Um, just starting at the bottom, fear of the Lord. <clears throat> now, is that a good fear or a bad fear? Yeah. Good fear. Okay, well, what does good fear look like? Uh, you know, understanding that the, the value of the power of the Lord. Okay. We're not like crushing, but like <laughs> that we have control over everything. Yeah, yeah, maybe like a healthy respect for the power and greatness of God. Um, and this one, sadly, I feel like is lessening the more and more as time goes on. I feel like people become or becoming more and more irreverent, so to speak. But yeah, fear of the Lord is meant to be this respect for the greatness of, of God himself. And that's manifested in the way we talk, right? Not using God's name in vain would be one way. Um, in the Old Testament, if you remember, they're not even allowed to say the name of God, right? They have to substitute that word Adonai for Lord as like a title. Um, maybe only the high priest once a year can utter God's name. And the point of that is his name is so holy, right? Um, and to speak somebody's name is to have a certain intimacy with them. And so what intimacy, at least at that time in the scriptures, do we have with God? Like they didn't have it yet. All right, now we're further along in the divine pedagogy, so we have that intimacy. Um, but at the same time, intimacy also can breed contempt in a way. Yeah. Oh, I was going to add to fear of the Lord. Um, it took me a long time to wrap my mind around like a way to think of that, and respect is like the beginning of it, but I think it leads to a desire to not disappoint God. Like the way that you wouldn't want to disappoint your father, you know, because you respect him and he takes care of you, and you wouldn't want to disappoint your parents. Yeah. The same kind of thing with the fear of the Lord is this, this desire to not disappoint. Yeah, and that reminds me of when we talk about confession, oops, perfect and imperfect contrition. Um, imperfect contrition being like you're afraid of going to hell versus perfect contrition is like you begin to understand how you offended God's love. Right. Yeah, so probably, yeah, same thing here. Probably the beginning, you're right, is sort of a uh, whoa yeah. <laughs> yeah and then and then yeah later on growing deeper in that um okay so uh, in our language okay not wanting to you know let god down um but also too one thing to think about and i was watching an interview with jim cathedral i don't know if y'all know he's the actor who played jesus but he's also done a bunch of other movies and he's really really emphasizing this of what do we do when our culture or other people in our culture disrespect our faith or disrespect take God's name in vain or do something blasphemous? Um, yeah. What's that? Yeah, I I think that's the right answer. What what does that look like? Obviously, because we do have free speech, which is a good thing, but I feel like we're we kind of get picked on a lot compared to other faiths. And I don't know, I'm curious what y'all think about that. I think Jesus like, preached the like, accepting that he would and make fun of us and that we have to like, say the things God. That's a good point. Sermon on the Mount, right? Pray for your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Okay, that's a good point. Yep. Okay, <laughs> how do we reconcile these two responses? Because I feel like both are right calling them out on it, like standing up for your beliefs, but then also praying and loving your enemies. Can we reconcile those two responses? How do we do that? Yeah. I, I think it begins, like, for me, I used to get angry when I'd hear people, you know, say, oh, Jesus Christ, or, you know, uh, he's in the God's name in vain. And I started to realize, well, okay, I can't change other people. I can only change myself. But through prayer, I can help them, mm -hmm. and I want to do kind of like a mini penance. For, so, like in my work, one of my bosses, she would always just yell, "Oh, Jesus Christ!" Right? Oh, Jesus. And so, under my breath, or even in silence, I would say, "King of Heaven and Earth," 
or I, you know, I would turn it into a prayer, like almost as an apology to God mm. uh, and an honoring of, of His name. Yeah. You know, in my mind, um, and so it would put me in a better mindset. And I don't know. I guess that's where it can start, and yeah. then love of neighbor, maybe through your example. You can't really force people to change. You can only influence them through your example. That's a good point. Yeah, make kind of making reparation yes. for their blasphemy with your own prayer. Yeah. Near my house, there's a billboard. Uh, I think it says like, "Wise men follow the star," but then it has a Dallas Cowboy star there. <laughs> um, and part of me is like, it's kind of funny, but part of me is like, it also upsets me. Um, so I'm not sure. Anybody else? I like that, making reparation. Anybody else have any thoughts on reconciling these two perspectives? <clears throat> there is a, uh, in the Passion, there is a moment where uh, I think it's Herod or Herodias um, is interrogating Jesus and he slaps him. And forgetting the exact details, but Jesus like kind of corrects him. Like if I said something wrong, um, if I didn't say something wrong, why did you slap me? Um, and I don't know. I feel like there is some middle ground here between being like letting ourselves be trampled on and then becoming like aggressive with somebody. Um, obviously, that's probably hard to navigate. But I think it. I think we do owe something to God as far as like. Keeping that sense, trying to keep that sense of respect for him. Um, the liturgy is another big thing I think about with this. When I see like liturgical abuses, um, I feel like that kind of falls under this, where it's not we're not showing God the proper respect that He deserves, um, and that's something in our own how in our own house, so to speak, which we can correct. But okay, uh, moving from there to fortitude. Uh, fortitude is. Similar to courage, courage though is a natural virtue. Uh, fortitude is a supernatural gift uh, from the Holy Spirit. Now, how would y'all define courage, just in the natural sense? Yeah. And being able to take on anything just like in spite of like your fear of it. Okay, in spite of your fear. Okay, so it's maybe not not feeling fear, but doing something difficult in spite of your fear. Okay, now um, imagine the Holy Spirit aiding you in that process, so strengthening that natural virtue. And I think a good example of this would be some of the martyrs, right? Um, Ignatius of Antioch, that early, early bishop who was being transported to Rome to be executed, um, and he wrote those letters to five different Christian communities along the way. And one of the things that he wrote, a beautiful line, was, um, I long to be ground up by the lions like the wheat for the Eucharist. And you think, man, how does somebody write that? He knows he's going to be brutally executed, but yet he's looking forward to it. And I think that's a good example where some of these saints, they have this gift of fortitude, and they're not afraid. Uh, another one, Maximilian, not afraid even of death, I should say. Maximilian Kolbe um, in Auschwitz, you know, being lined up um, with prisoners being chosen who are going to be executed, put in a starvation bunker, and one of the guys falls on his knees and says, please, like, don't take me. I have a wife. I have a family. And Maximilian stepped out of the line and confronted the Nazi guard and um, told him, I'll take his place. And he think he took that guard aback so much he was like okay and let him actually take his place but I when I think of fortitude I think of those saints and there's nothing that you can do to them that's going to make them afraid because they're so rooted in, in God even if you torture them even if you put them through the most brutal suffering you can't you can't affect their spirit uh, another example in the 1600s uh, some of the Jesuits from Europe came to North America to try to bring the gospel to the Native Americans. And they kind of made it to, like, where I guess today where the border of Canada and the U.S. would be. 
and they're ministering to these tribes. Um, one in particular, Saint Jean de Rebouf. He um, had just introduced himself to this tribe, and they were unsure about him, and they were debating whether or not they were going to kill him, torture and kill him. And so they left him in this little hut or whatever while they went and discussed. And they came back, and they found him asleep, taking a nap. He wasn't even phased by this, knowing probably the horrible tortures um, that he had heard the Native Americans doing to each other and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, the Holy Spirit strengthening that, that gift of courage in the face of adversity. Um, now, those stories, at least to me when I think about it, those stories uh, sound awesome. Then I think about my own life, and then I get nervous. <laughs> Um, as far as standing up for the faith, you know, in a way that's going to cause some type of pushback or tension with somebody or controversy of some sort. Um, I deal with this somewhat um, in the high school because, you know, there are certain topics that I have to talk about. But I know there's going to be people who get upset, who some kids have stormed out of class over certain topics or they'll be rude or they'll try to report you and get you in trouble for something like that. But, um, and I can usually handle that. I'm not too worried about it. But there's other areas of my life where I think, man, would I stand up for this truth even if it meant that I went to jail? Or even if I meant that I got into an altercation with somebody? Uh, recently, I think there was um, a case where the FBI raided uh, this a father, I think he's like a father of 10, Catholic man's home because he was praying outside of an abortion clinic and somebody was accosting his son. And so he like shoved the guy away to get him away from his son. And then um, it was brought up in like a civil case, I think, which was dropped. But then the FBI raided his house anyway and took him away. Um, I forget... It was some violation that, that happened that he broke. But so it's like you think about that, it's like, man, I used to pray at the abortion clinic all the time. Um, am I willing to risk that? Another, uh, a friend of mine, his mother in law was praying at the abortion clinic up in Greenville, and um, she was physically attacked by an individual. This was like a month ago, uh, maybe less. I think this individual had, um, sorry for the vulgarity of this, had like poop spray or fart spray or something and was going and spraying people who were there praying and also had like a very vulgar sign of like make an abortion smoothie or something. Here's the recipe, like taunting people. And so my friend's mother-in-law, I think, shook a little holy water on the sign after the person was spraying her. And then this individual like launched at her and gave her a black eye and was like kicking and punching. And then um, her husband took this individual to the ground. And in the meantime, he had a body camera that was like stripped off of him and he couldn't find it later. But that individual went online in whatever footage they had selectively edited the part only where they were being pushed to the ground and posted it on a bunch of sites saying like, look how I was attacked. Here, these are these people's names. This is where they go to church, Prince of Peace Catholic Church. And basically, I don't know, try to dox them on a bunch of like Antifa sites. So I can definitely feel the tension rising. Um, and so I'm asking myself that all the time. Like, do I have the fortitude to still go and pray, for example, or still speak on certain topics that I know are going to get pushed back on? And probably all of y'all can think about your own examples of that in your workplace or in your personal life or whatnot. So I think more than ever, we should be reflecting on, on this gift. Uh, let me stop with those two. Any thoughts, comments you want to add? Fear of the Lord, fortitude. Are y'all seeing other examples, kind of like the ones I'm mentioning? Any what that y'all are willing to share? I've seen the FBI report of them. Uh, 
having, um, I guess, spies in the Catholic churches because of extremism? Oh, man, no. I know they had labeled people who go to the Latin Mass as part of, like, in, on an extremist group list. I didn't know they were putting, like, undercover. Oh, my. Um, anybody else want to share? Well, since y'all are probably or in the military or going into the military, um, there's another story of a friend of mine. This is from several years ago, and a uh, friend who was in the Air Force. Um, he was deployed over to Africa, and I guess. Uh, I don't know all the rank structure, but he's some type of officer, <clears throat> so he had people beneath him. And while they're over there, uh, this, so through there, they were through the summer, and so it's the month of June, and so there were people in his charge who put up a bunch of gay pride posters. And But then the month of June was over, and so now we're on to July, it's no longer gay pride month, and so he took the posters down, and he got in a lot of trouble. I guess the individual who put them up filed some type of report, and he had to get his own lawyer, military lawyer, but he basically didn't get the promotions that he was supposed to get. It got dragged out for several years. Um, eventually, I think, well, he got like a negative letter put in his file. Eventually, I think that led him to getting out of the Air Force. But it was something, I guess, to him so innocuous, like, all right, the month is over. Let's take down the decorations. But you know, I don't know. You never know how these things are gonna are gonna play out. So, okay, uh, let's move on then to the gift of counsel. The gift of counsel would be sort of like the supernatural virtue of prudence. So the natural virtue of prudence is knowing <clears throat> the best means. To your desired end. So it's like a practical virtue. If this is the goal that I'm trying to reach, what is the best way in which I can reach that goal? That's considered prudent. Counsel is prudence elevated by the Holy Spirit. And so as we go through our life making these decisions, the gift of counsel is supposed to be the Holy Spirit guiding you to make these everyday choices, uh, to make the right choices. Um, something that I've definitely been praying for a, a lot more, given these examples that I'm talking about, I try to stop and say, like, if I'm confused on how to act, please, Holy Spirit, grant me the gift of counsel, you promise, help me to make the right choice in this situation. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think what more to say about counsel other than I think it is kind of promised, right? Remember in Acts of the Apostles, uh, where, well, actually, I guess Jesus says it, but then you see it in Acts of the Apostles, where he says, like, you're going to be um, taken before kings and before governors um, to testify to me. <clears throat> but in those moments, don't worry about what to say. I'll give you what to say. Um, so that is kind of comforting. Like, be bold, and then let the Holy Spirit guide you in those moments. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so even at baptism, you do receive uh, the gifts. Confirmation deepens those gifts. Um, it's like the completion of baptism. And I'm actually going to talk about how those two sacraments became split um, at the end of today. But yeah, you, you even being baptized, you still have those gifts. So your understanding also. Um, I'm pretty sure about that. Okay, um, piety. Piety, anybody want to take that one? It's not a word we use a whole lot. Um, but my understanding of piety is a supernatural aid to your devotion, to prayer, to uh, the different obligations that you have in the faith. <clears throat> so uh, during COVID, remember we, well, the masses were shut down. We couldn't go to church. And I think for a lot of people, including myself, 
somebody who had gone like every Sunday almost my whole life, um, except for a, cu- a handful of times. Um, even af- you know after we got out of the habit of going, we're just like, well, I'll watch it on the live stream. And then it was like, well, I'll kind of watch it and I'll just kind of lay on the couch while I watch it. And then it was like, oh, I'm not going to watch the live stream. So like I could see myself sliding out of that habit. Um, and I had to like really check myself, say, hey, whoa, 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 what am I doing? Because we got to the point, remember, where it was like, wasn't an obligation, but you could go to mass. And that was like six months or a year, I want to say. And I found myself saying like, well... I think I got a little something that would tickle my throat. Maybe I shouldn't go. Maybe I should sleep in. Um, and I was losing that habit that I had built for so long. And it took me a little bit to like check myself and get back back into it and say, hey, no, this is important. Um, I have to make again this again a routine. So piety is supposed to be that gift that aids us in keeping these different obligations that we have. One that not a lot of people know about is, or we're familiar with fasting during Lent on Fridays uh, from meat, but actually um, the church's discipline is to do that all year round on Fridays to fast from meat. But there is one caveat. You can substitute that for a different type of penance if you want to. But every Friday of the year we're supposed to be doing some penance to connect with our Lord's passion. Um, but it's it's hard. Right? I have to catch myself all the time, like with hamburger in my mouth on Friday. Like, oh crap! <laughs> um, but what am I going to do for a penance now? And then like the day passes, and it's like, oh shoot, it's already like late Friday night. Well, I'll count something I did that was uncomfortable today as my penance, and <laughs> hopefully that works. Uh, but that's again not ideal. If I had more piety. I would think ahead of time about that obligation and devotion, about eating something other than meat, or maybe doing a more intentional penance, like saying the Divine Mercy Chaplet or something like that. Um, so that's what that gift is supposed to help with. All right, I pause for those two. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, the last three can seem confusing because they all sound similar. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. What's the difference between those two things? Or three things. Um, And the easy way to understand it is if you keep them like in the order that I have, knowledge um, is the Holy Spirit helping you to understand the world around you better. So that could be even like the sciences or math or history, or whatever fill-in-the-blank discipline. Um, The gift of knowledge is meant to help you in that pursuit. Above that, think of like higher truths. Understanding is meant to help you understand theology. So the church is teaching whatever on faith and morals. Uh, People struggle with different, you know, of those teachings. So understanding is meant to aid you in uncovering and realizing those truths. And then higher than that is wisdom. And wisdom is like a union with God, which is so close that you know the right thing, or you know these deep truths because of that intimacy. And sometimes I like to describe it like knowing somebody, let's say you go on Facebook and you look at their info, and you see pictures of them, you see whatever, what school they went to, what their job is. All right, you can know things about them, but that's not the same as, let's say, the way you know your brother who you've lived with your whole life. Um, because one, you have an, like an intimacy, I guess the term would be co-natural, co-natural knowledge in theology. It's like a lived knowledge or a lived experience. And so somebody could look on Facebook and see, oh, yes, your brother went out to eat. This is a restaurant we'd go to because he put that down. But you would say, no, I know my brother. Actually, he didn't like that restaurant anymore. That's old news or old information. He actually would go here. So wisdom is kind of like that the lived intimacy with God um, that enlightens your mind on those deep truths, which is why a lot of the great minds of the church, they not only did academic pursuits, but they incorporated prayer into their academics. 
So, for example, when St. Thomas would be stumped on a particular philosophical issue, let's say, that he was writing about, he would then stop and go into a time of prayer. And in that time of prayer and intimacy with God, he would actually sometimes gain insights which would help him um, overcome those philosophical um, issues. So that, that's the highest form that we want to strive, strive for. And hopefully all the other gifts are leading us towards that ultimate intimacy with, with God in wisdom. All right, I pause. Uh, anything on those last three? Okay, um, <clears throat> so those are kind of the seven traditional gifts, but St. Paul, I believe in 1 Corinthians, also mentions different charisms of the Spirit. So each individual member of the body has a special calling or gift by the Holy Spirit to aid the rest of the body in some way. And St. Paul lists a bunch of them. Some people are called the charism of healing others, others to prophecy, others to speaking in tongues, others to interpreting those tongues, um, others to be teachers, others to be evangelists. Um, there's like a whole long list of them. But uh, that being said, so one of the things that we should do, talk about the Holy Spirit, is be praying what particular gift or charism God has for you. Um, and if you continue that prayer, hopefully over time you begin to see what that might be, especially some of the more um, supernatural ones, I guess I could say. Like a friend of mine I know has a, has a gift of healing, and he's prayed over several people, and they have been healed of things. Um, another coworker of mine has a gift of tongues, and I believe uh, in one of the times this gift manifested itself, she spoke... Chinese, even though she doesn't know Chinese, um, which is crazy. Um, another example of the gift of tongues I've heard about, I don't know if anybody knows Father Romanowski. He was a priest at Blessed Sacrament in West Ashley for several years. But um, a friend of mine went with him to a pilgrimage to World Youth Day, maybe like 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, World Youth Day is like every couple years the Pope invites all the young people of the world to a particular city for two weeks. So this year was in um, Rio in Brazil. And Father Romanowski is with this group. And it's like the, the first day of World Youth Day. And he really wants to hear the Pope speak at the opening ceremony. But being a priest, he got pulled aside and said, like, hey, can you help with confession? And he's like, oh, man, I really, <laughs> this always goes long. And I know I'm going to miss the Pope. And I really want to see the Pope. But. All right, I'll do it. So he's in like I think like a big field, and they have like tons of priests and all these lines of pilgrims going to confession. So he, he would ever hear his confession for however long. This is the Pope, so he's still kind of grumbling about it. But he finally finishes and gets up from confession, is walking away. And the priest who was stationed nearby him stops him. He's like, whoa, 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 hey, Father, uh, how many languages do you know? And he said, how many languages? I just, I only know English. What do you mean? And he's like, are you sure? Because I kind of overheard you speaking like a bunch of different languages. Whatever language the pilgrim came up to you and started speaking, you responded to them in that language. And he's like, what? No, I didn't. I've been speaking English this whole time. And then I think he had a moment where he just began to break down in tears because he realized this whole time he's been like kind of grumbling at God. God has been working this miracle. And I guess trans, kind of like at Pentecost, translating between what the person was saying and what he was hearing, and then what he was saying, what they were hearing. So World Youth Day, there's people from, from all over. So who knows what languages were being spoken. But for him, he only heard English and was only speaking English, but yet communicated with them. Um, and apparently this has happened to him more than once in confession. So that's another modern example that I've heard of. Um, let's see what else. Healing, speaking in tongues. Um, there are some people I know who do have that gift of prophecy and like to pray over people and to kind of give them sort of like uh, an inspirational message which is related to them. Um, most of the stuff I've encountered in the, what's called the charismatic renewal, 
movement. Has anybody heard of that phrase, charismatic renewal? I don't know if it's as much down here, but when I lived in New Jersey, it was definitely more popular. The charismatic renewal is like a movement in the church, I believe, started in the 1980s. Um, a group of people at a particular u uh, university, I always forget the name, it starts with a D, I know it's in Ohio, Duquesne, I don't know. But anyway, they're a group, and they were reading Acts of the Apostles, and they were saying like, hey, why don't we experience all these gifts that the Bible's talking about? And so they began to pray intentionally for those gifts, and they began to receive them, and then kind of spread <clears throat> this devotion out. And they kind of caught some some fire. And I've seen it where I've seen people prayed over, and that kind of like almost like activates the gift that they have. And it's not crazy because um, in First Timothy, Paul kind of says that to Timothy, hey, Timothy, stir up the gifts that has been given to you when I laid hands on you. And so that's kind of what they focus on, praying over people, trying to stir up whatever particular gift that they have, and letting that person then sort of manifest whatever charism or gift of the Spirit that they might have. Um, it's also real popular, I believe, at Franciscan University in Ohio. So that's kind of where I've experienced most of this stuff. But, um, but I don't know if it's made its way down here as, as much. Um, a couple other things about charisms I was going to mention. There are, even within particular calls, there are, I guess you could say, calls within calls. So where the Holy Spirit um, calls certain people to live, let's say if you're already religious, to live that religious life in a particular way. Um, so, for example, Benedictines are called to stay at their monastery and to dedicate their lives to prayer and to work, to praying for the world and to and working to meet their needs. But they don't really go out of the monastery. Whereas, like a Dominican, their particular call is to preach and to teach people. And so they're, they'll go anywhere, right? They'll travel all over. Um, and they're mostly, a lot of times, universities. Um, so they can engage people academically and intellectually. Um, the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa, their charism, right, to deal, to work with the poorest of the poor. And so they're going to go places where they can find those people and take care of, you know, the most needy people among us. Um, other types of charisms, like we mentioned, certain priests are called to be exorcists, for example. Um, certain people are called to be missionaries. I've heard of um, different couples, married couples, giving up a part of their time to go to other countries to be missionaries, let's say for a year or for a couple of years. So the Holy Spirit is always working and guiding you, and sometimes... He may be calling you into this particular way of life for a period of time. All right, pause. Anything on that that y'all want to mention? Okay, I wanted to finish today talking about um, virtue and vice, because I think those two topics are related to this. Um, has anybody, has anybody heard of the seven deadly sins before? Let's see if we could list them. I just want to throw, throw one off. Sloth, gluttony, gluttony lust, envy. What's that? Pride. Oh, pride, good. And wrath. Uh, oh, wait, we're we missing one. Greed. Greed, okay. And, okay, good, gluttony. Yeah, so y'all are familiar with those. Let's just kind of run through them together. Um, if you think about them, they kind of have a logic to them if you list them in a particular order. Um, and I believe this is the order that Dante wrote about them in.
but you have a whole range of these things from pride, which is like a very spiritual type of deadly sin, down to lust, which maybe is the most like base or bodily deadly sins. All right, and then you have those in between, so you're kind of like a mixture. Um, but the church tells us that pride is actually the, the deadliest of them. Why is that? It's the least bodily, but the most deadly. What's the connection there? The least bodily, but the most deadly. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, people think too highly of themselves, shutting down the rest of the world because they know everything. Why is it more deadly though than like lust? Or perhaps it's because if you're spiritually dead or spiritually corrupted, you're eternally yeah. corrupted. If your body okay. is corrupted, you can only a path to the redemption. Okay. Yeah. Um, that spiritual corruption, uh, pride is talking about like the doorway to all the other vices. So if you're corrupt in that sense, you're probably going to have all the others too. <laughs> going to come tag along with it. Okay. Um, pride is also talking about as the sin of Satan. Why? Yeah. Satan probably be kind of God. Okay. Good. Okay. Thought he was better or higher than God, right? Wanted to be in God's place to rule over something. Okay, and um, just think about that for a minute. An angel, supposedly so powerful and beautiful, the light bearer, pride was so corrupting to this incredible being that it's, it diluted him into thinking that separation from God would be better than heaven. And this separation to rule his own kingdom, I mean, who wants to be king of hell when you really think about it? What are you ruling over as king of hell? Um, the worst, you know, possible selfishness and perversion. and But yet, I think you're right. Pride is such a distortion of reality for that individual that they think... Maybe it's better to be king of hell than to be a servant in heaven. And so Lucifer's phrase traditionally is non servium, I will not serve. And I think that goes to the point of how it can be most deadly. If your mind, your view of yourself is so corrupted that you're willing to destroy everything else, everyone else, everything good in your life to feed that corruption, what won't you do in service to that. You'll, of course, commit all the other deadly sins in service to that delusion. Okay, and uh, so yeah, that's a good summary of pride. It's like a, a delusion or distortion of reality. Delusion or distortion of reality. And you see this with Satan, right? The devil can't create on his own. All he can do is pervert. And so he takes everything good that God has made and he perverts it, he flips it upside down, and pretends that it's his own creation. And so if you look into the occult, you see a lot of it mirrors Catholicism, right? Instead of prayers, you have spells. And instead of a mass, they have their own black mass, right? Instead of communion, where we take the Eucharist, they steal the Eucharist and um, desecrate it with the most base acts. Um, so... Instead of our cross, right, they flip the cross and upside down cross. There's a whole bunch of things you could, parallels you could find. Um, because, again, it's a, it's a delusion. It's a delusion. All right, what's the antidote to pride? That sounds terrible when we put it like that. What? So what do we do? Yeah. Good. Good, good humility, humility. And so you can think of uh, the traditional work of St. Michael. Satan says, non servium, I will not serve. And Michael, his name, Mikael, and Hebrew means, who is like God? 
right? So it's like a response to Satan, like, you're not God. There's nobody like God. So, like, get in your place. Um, and so Michael represents humility, which is fundamentally um, accepting the truth of things. All right, truth is the antidote to that distortion of reality. Now, wait, humility, to be humble, that means I got to, like, put myself down, right? I'm, I'm no good, I'm trash, I'm garbage. I got to be sort of willing to submit to everybody. Is that? Okay, no, no, good. Why is that not humility? Okay, good, yeah. Perfect. Is it true that you're trash and garbage and no good? No, that's just as much a lie, right? Because there's many good things about each of us, right? We all have gifts and talents. Um, it's just recognizing, hey, I'm good at this, but ultimately it's because God gave me this talent or he allowed me to develop this talent through hard work or whatever it is. So, yeah, the truth is always in the middle, right? It's not the lie on one extreme that I'm nothing or the lie on the other extreme that I'm everything. Um, but it's like a humble recognition of what is true. Okay. Uh, envy. How would you all define envy? Jealousy, coveting. Uh, I don't know what your parent is, but just like coveting something of your neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good way. It's most like jealousy is like the feeling, but like envy is like the act, like wanting to do. <coughs> like if, say, a friend of yours like is dating a girl you like, and then you just want both of them to suffer for him. That's <laughs> yeah. most of envy, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There's a, um, I think there's a German word that some people I've heard use, Schadenfreude. I think they've heard of that, where it's like. <laughs> It's like when somebody fails at something, you feel kind of good about it because maybe maybe I'm better than I thought I was. Um, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, but it's a, a type of jealousy that doesn't allow us to appreciate the truth of, of our own goodness. So to speak, because we're always right looking at what other people have, right? We feel happy when somebody else fails at something. All right, we can't rejoice with our friends when they succeed because it's kind of like a threat to our own self worth. Uh, Dante, um, in his work, The Purgatory, um, you know, they, they have to climb out Purgatory to be purified of their sins. Well, the envious have to have their eyes sewn shut so they'll stop looking at what everybody else has and learn to appreciate what they have. Um, so that's a good point. The antidote to envy is admiration being able to take a step back and realize, wait a minute, I'm so focused on what I don't have. Do I realize, whoa, I'm healthy, right? I have access to an education. I've got a future ahead of me. I have good friends. I have a good relationship with my family. Whatever, fill in the blank. I have a lot of amazing things going on for me. All right, we got 10 minutes. So I'm going to uh, speed up a little bit. Anger um, as a deadly sin is... A desire for revenge which goes beyond right reason. That's Thomas's definition. A desire for revenge that goes beyond right reason. Now, why the right reason part? Because there is a healthy or righteous anger that we see Jesus exhibit in the Gospels, right? When he overturns the tables. Maybe that goes back to fear of the war we were just talking about. Um, and so it can actually be bad if we see injustice or we see somebody being hurt or taken advantage of and we don't feel anything for it. So if we see something like human trafficking or child trafficking, for example, that should spark a righteous anger in our hearts to go out and to want to fix that and to help those people and put an end to that. Um, so 
I don't want to say that, that that's bad. That's definitely a good thing. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, as a deadly sin, though, <clears throat> it would be like a disproportional response. So, like going too far, letting the emotion of anger take over, such that then we we lash out and we cause more harm than good. Um, you can think uh, again, going back to Dante, that the angry bear smoke blown in their eyes so they can't see um, because that represents what happens when we get angry. Think about any time you've had a road rage. If you really think about it, somebody cuts you off or something. They don't know you. They probably didn't even see what you look like. They're not going to have a second thought about you. But we get so angry about it. It's like, I'm going to chase them down and I'm going to ram their car or something. You know, um, That would be an example where the emotion of it takes over so much that it leads to this completely disproportional response. To something. Okay, the uh, antidote to anger would be something like forgiveness. Forgiveness. Um, and forgiveness is a little bit different than justice. If you think of justice as like, I have to give you what you deserve and you give me what I deserve, like kind of meet in the middle on this, so to speak. Forgiveness as an antidote to anger is kind of like doing more than you even have to to help somebody or to right a wrong with somebody. Um, so bearing another's burden, so to speak, going the extra mile for them, like Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, um, showing them extra grace, giving them the benefit of the doubt, those would be things that would calm that anger, be an antidote to it. Okay, uh, sloth. <coughs> what do you all have for sloth? What is that? That's a kind of a weird word, but. Laziness. Okay, laziness. Now, it's a particular type of laziness. Laziness in regard to. Our spiritual life. Our spiritual life. So you can actually be a really productive person and be slothful. Because it's like an indifference to God, um, or an indifference to the spiritual life. And in a lot of ways, well, there's a famous Protestant theologian, Karl Barth, who called this the sin of our age. And I think a lot, in a lot of ways, he's kind of right. Because we kind of live in this like, kind of culture of moral relativism, right, where there is no truth with the capital T. It's like, well, my truth and your truth and his truth. And so if everything's just relative to each individual, well, then there's not really like a, like a fire in your belly to pursue what's right. Because like, well, it's different for everybody. Who's to say what's right and what's wrong and everything like that? And so as a result of that, you have a spiritual kind of indifference, which kind of takes over um, the culture where, you know, nothing really seems... These big questions don't really seem to matter. And a lot of people will say, like, well, let's just focus on, you know, technology, like developing technology, making better equipment and housing and transportation. But those big questions of right and wrong, let's just leave those in the past. Um, unfortunately, this is prevalent in a lot of philosophy. But that's, again, representative of this spiritual like indifference. Um, so the antidote to that is traditionally zeal. Zeal is like a spiritual passion for God. <clears throat> it's like a deep desire to know what God has planned for you to do with your life and then to go out and to vigorously pursue it. Um, since we're running a long time, I'll kind of go fast with these last three. Greed and gluttony are similar in that they're... Um, unhealthy desires for either material possessions or food and drink. Like an unhealthy desire for spiritual possessions or for food and drink. <clears throat> and they're also desires that are never fulfilled because <clears throat> we're trying to fill up our desire for God with physical things. 
until we keep consuming and consuming and consuming, we get a little bit of temporary satisfaction, but that wears off, right? And then we look for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And so if we kind of put that as like our highest goal, it's just a sort of treadmill of constant consumption, desire, pursuit, consumption, <coughs> desire, pursuit, and never uh, fulfillment in those things. And so to greed would be like generosity um, and this idea of what John Paul II calls the law of the gift. So the more I give away in a tangible material sense, the more I gain in a spiritual sense. So let's say my friend is in need, all right, and I give him, I don't know, some, some money to help him pay his rent, or I give him time, or... Um, I give him some item, he can borrow my car or something. I'm losing in the physical sense, and the greedy part of me might object to that. But in a deeper spiritual sense, I find a deeper happiness in that now I've built a friendship. Now I've gone beyond my own ego and I've connected in relationship to another person. Um, and so the law of the gift is the more that I give away, the more my being and, and happiness increases. Okay, um, gluttony and then lust real fast. Um, <clears throat> lust is to objectify a person for their sexual value. To objectify a person for their sexual value. And I use that word objectify uh, intentionally because objectify meaning to turn into an object instead of a person. Now, what's significant about that? Well, where do objects get their value from? Objects have value only insofar as they serve some need or purpose of you. And so, uh, like this marker, right? It has value only insofar as it allows me to write on the board, but as soon as it doesn't meet that need, it has no more value for me, and we're all okay if I toss it into the bin, right? But now think about how that would translate into uh, our view of other people. Right, you have value only insofar as you serve some need for me. And then as soon as you stop meeting that need, then you don't have value anymore. Right? We, we inherently know like something's not right with that. And so John Paul, again, will emphasize, you no, know, people have value in and of themselves. They are ends, meaning they are a, a valid final purpose um, in and of themselves, not just because they serve some other purpose, and so uh, lust is when we transgress that and we say, your only value is your sexual value because I get some type of pleasure out of that. Now, that's not saying that sexual pleasure is bad in Catholicism. <coughs> like, to the contrary, but only in its proper place. So it's like, um, once the foundation of love and commitment and self-gift is set, then pleasure finds its proper place to be truly experienced in the deepest sense. But if there's not that foundation of love or self-giving or commitment, then what happens is if pleasure is the only goal, you can substitute pleasure for selfishness because that's really the, the reason the two people are using one another, not for some higher end, but only for themselves because pleasure is only experienceable for you, right? You can't share that subjective feeling with another person. Um, and so two people may use each other, but in the end, right, it's gonna lead to some type of hurt or rupture or brokenness because they know at the end of the day that it is at their core selfish. All right, it is 7.30, so we'll pause here unless there's any questions or comments I wanna leave us off with. Oh, yeah, sure. What's that? Uh, anger specifically, or uh, anger? Yeah, um, well, the uh, virtues and vices are fundamentally habits. And I recommend a book by Aristotle, his Nicomachean Ethics, chapter one, where he talks about habits. Habits um, are dispositions that we build 
based off of daily action. So the more you do something, the easier it becomes to do that, whether that's something bad or something good. And so I would say daily practice on the good stuff where you want to get to. Um, not, you're not going to make a huge jump, but it's like taking little bites or little steps every day towards your towards your goal. That's what I, I would say. All right. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Don't forget to sign in if you haven't already.